Here I've got a nice family of integrals that I'd like to evaluate. And these integrals show up a lot of different places. Namely, I've seen them on several different versions of the MIT Integration B, the practice problems, as well as the exam. That's because this is a really good example of a certain trick for integration. So in particular, we want to find the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the n minus 1 over natural log of x, where n is a non-negative integer. So it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. We're going to do this using two very, very related methods. In fact, you can prove that the ability to use one of these methods is equivalent to the ability to use the other method, which would be honestly kind of a ridiculously difficult way to calculate this integral. But like I said, I think it's a bit of a challenge. I'm not sure it's like really reasonable or possible. Okay, so our first method will be using Feynman's differentiation under the integral sign technique. And so in order to do that, we need to define a function. And that function should have a continuous variable instead of this n, which is a discrete parameter or a discrete variable. We need a continuous variable here because we need to talk about taking the derivative. You can't quite do that with a discrete variable. Okay, so we'll define f of y to be equal to the integral from zero to one of x to the y minus one over the natural log of x dx. And we'll start by noticing that f of zero is very clearly equal to zero. That's because the integrand collapses just to zero, so we're integrating over the zero function. Okay, so now let's take the derivative of this, building a differential equation for our goal function. Okay, so let's take the derivative with respect to y. I'll call that f prime of y. So that is going to be the integral from zero to one of the derivative with respect to y of x to the y over the natural log of x. Keeping in mind that the derivative with respect to y of the number one is zero because that's a constant. Now we're gonna use standard derivative rules. Here this partial derivative views x as a constant. So we can rewrite this as, let's see what it'll be. It'll be x to the y times the natural log of x over the natural log of x, great. And again, like I said, that's from the standard derivative rule that this, this derivative, which I've overlined in pink, turns into this. Okay, nice. But now we can do some standard cancellation. This natural log of x will cancel this natural log of x. That leaves us with x to the y. But since our values of n should be bigger than or equal to zero, that means our values of y should also be bigger than or equal to zero. So I'll say this is the closed interval from zero to infinity. Those are the values of y that we're interested in, meaning we can use the power rule. In fact, we can use the power rule almost everywhere else. The only place we can't use the power rule is when y is equal to negative one. So in fact, this would give us some sort of reasonable idea for the value of this for all integers n except for n equal negative one. But we're just gonna focus on this case. Okay, so anyway, with the power rule, we have this is one over y plus one evaluated times x evaluated from zero to one, which gives us one over y plus one. But that's f prime of y telling us that f of y is the antiderivative of that, or I should say an antiderivative of that. Here we get the natural log of y plus one. We don't need an absolute value here because we're taking y to be non-negative. So in that previous discussion, we would need to include an absolute value if we expanded the values of n that we were interested in here. Notice that n equals negative one, which is the same thing as y equals negative one, would give us the natural log of zero here, and that would be super problematic. It would obviously also give us the one over zero over here. And in fact, if you just immediately plug in y equals negative one here, you, this integral will diverge, but we won't check that. So, okay, so where are we? We've got f of y is natural log of y plus one. We need to add a constant. But notice that constant will be the value of f at zero. 
And that's because if we plug y equals zero into this, we'll get the natural log of one, which is zero. So that's the constant that we're missing. But that constant was equal to zero, meaning that f of y was equal to the natural log of y plus one. Meaning our integral over here, so maybe I'll just call this star, so I'll put pink star. So this pink star is in fact equal to the natural log of n plus one, where n is being restricted to these integers. Okay, so let's clean this up and then we're gonna do this another way, another a way that's kind of more common for what we've done on the channel before, and then I'll give you a challenge. So now we're ready to look at this using a related, in fact, an equivalent method. And that is to rewrite this as a double integral and then exchange the order of integration. And that exchange of the order of integration, the ability to do that is equivalent to the ability of taking the derivative on, under the integral sign. Maybe I'll get around to making a video about that equivalence later. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna rewrite this as the integral from zero to one of x to the y minus one over the natural log of x, where we have evaluated this from y equals zero up to y equals n, then dx. So this is like writing this as a zeroth integral. And then I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to rewrite this as a single integral. So a zeroth integral is really just the evaluation of a function. That's actually related to the notion of a zero form versus a one form, which is something that I've done previously in my playlist about differential forms if you're interested. Okay, so anyway, now we can transform this into a single integral inside of this single integral, in other words, an iterated integral, by taking the derivative of this with respect to y. That'll leave us with the integral from zero to one, and then the integral from zero to n of, well, doing the same thing that we did before, take the derivative, we'll end up with exactly x to the y dy dx. Now, we know we can change the order of integration if and only if, the double integral absolutely converges. And we can actually check that really quickly, and that's called Fubini's theorem. So here we can take the double integral over zero one cross zero n. So let's recall that the double integral is over a two dimensional region, whereas this is really an iterated integral. It's a single integral inside of a single integral. Now these are equal, if this sort of thing holds, but they're not equal if this sort of thing doesn't hold. Okay, so anyway, we can check that the double integral over this region of the absolute value of x, y, d, a is less than infinity. But that's pretty clearly less than infinity because notice on this region, 0, 1 cross 0, n, the x value is always between 0 and 1, meaning that this is less than or equal to the double integral of 1 to the y, but 1 to the y is always going to be equal to 1. So this is going to be the double integral dA over this region, 0, 1 cross 0, n, but that gives us the number n because that's the area of that rectangle but that n is less than plus infinity, so we've got absolute convergence here. We're okay. Okay, nice. So that means we're allowed to change the order of integration, so let's do that. So we've got the integral from zero to n, and then the integral from zero to one of x to the y dx dy, and now we're essentially home free. Taking that inside integral, we'll get one over y plus one times x to the y plus one evaluated from zero to one. That'll just give us one over y plus one. And then we'll have dy here. And then taking the antiderivative of this, we'll get the natural log of y plus one evaluated at the upper bound, will give us natural log of n plus one. Evaluating at the lower bound, we'll get the natural log of one, which is zero. So we end up with the same solution, which we should because we're doing the same problem. Okay, so before we sign off, let's talk about this challenge, which honestly I think would be a ridiculous way to try to do this. I played around with it for a few minutes and I didn't see a way to do it, but obviously I miss some things sometimes. And my challenge would be to do this just by a straightforward induction. 
So like I said, I think this is pretty hard, but if you guys have any insights as to if this is possible or tricks to get the ball rolling, maybe post them in the comments. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.